Hi booktube and welcome to a new video. Uh, this is a Friday Reads video. I didn't, I didn't do one last week for reasons I'll go into when I talk about the books that I'm currently or about to read. Uh, so this represents about two weeks worth. Um, and the five books I've completed are The Council of Egypt by Leonardo Schiaschia, an Italian author. It's published in 1966. Translated by Adrienne Fulca. Uh, Death by Anna Croissant Rust, turn of the 20th century uh, German uh, author. This was translated by uh, James J. Conway and is on a small independent German uh, publishing house called Rixdorf Editions. Uh, Percival Everett by Virgil Russell. Percival Everett is actually the author and the confusing nature of the uh, title I will explain when I talk about that book. Um, Patchett, State of Wonder. And uh, OK Mr Field by South African writer Catherine Kilalia, uh, who is uh, lives in London. OK, so I'm going to start with uh, The Council of Egypt. And I, anyone who's familiar with this book is going to say, Mark, this is a work of historical fiction. Uh, what are you doing reading that, given prostet pro my protestations about it in probably every third video I do? Uh, it's not a work of historical fiction. Uh, none of the characters, uh, the significant characters here, ever existed. It is a work of fiction set in the past, which I think is different to historical fiction, which, you know, f I think, to my mind, focuses on a real-life historical character or a historical event. Um, this is all purely made up for the imagination of the author, and beautifully so, and deals in the nature of truth and art and fiction and lies, um, and has a political, you know, um, the author was sort of uh, on the left in Italian politics, and, and it does. This is a book about, about politics. So it's set in about, uh, starts off in 1783, uh, a Benedictine... Uh, I'm not sure if he's a priest, but he's some sort of religious uh, guy uh, over from Malta, finds himself in, in uh, Sicily. Uh, and the ambassador uh, of Morocco is marooned there when his ship gets wrecked in those notorious Straits of Messina. And uh, he has uh, the, uh, the, the poor Benedictine monk, who's called Giuseppe Vela, is asked to um, be the translator to the, the Moroccan uh, guy who's, who speaks Arabic. And uh, they come across this codex, which uh, is actually just a version of uh, the life of the prophet, uh, Muhammad, uh, but is written in an interesting version of Arabic, which was a sort of fusion with, or a, a local version uh, dialect uh, with Sicily, because uh, as with the Spanish Moors, uh, Sicily uh, was also under um, Islamic rule for a period. Um, but the monk here uh, is a bit of a grifter and he tells everyone that no, this is, this is a long lost uh, sort of history of uh, Sicily under, under Islamic rule uh, and that he will translate it and, and, and put it out there. Um, no one else can really speak Arabic sufficiently um, so that uh, you know, he's, this is seen as a very important potential piece of work. And not only is he grifting to produce his book, he's also using the book to exploit and manipulate because Sicily is uh, one of two kingdoms ruled by the king, the king of Naples. And as with many uh, sort of, you know, through the history of, of medieval, medieval Europe onwards, there was always a battle between uh, the monarchy and the barons, the aristocracy over land rights and having to sort of provide money, taxes, army, all that sort of thing. And... Sicily is no different and there is a whiff of change in the air and as the novel progresses we hit the French Revolution and there's all those dangerous radical ideas of the Jacobins uh, you know translate down to Sicily and it looks like you know it, it could be ripe for a revolution when suddenly the barons of the monarchy find they have something in common which is to resist to resist the uh, the uprising of the common man. So it is a book about as I say about lies and fakery and, and stuff uh, but, you know, he's a true psychopath in that he, you know, he's so pleased with himself with pulling off this, this grift that, you know, but nobody knows, of course, because that would, that would betray his work. So uh, 
he decides he's going to do an even bigger project after you know this history of uh, Islamic Sicily, which is called uh, the Council of Sicily. It's finished. He's going to do the Council of Egypt, a much deeper Mediterranean uh, sort of wide history. And he employs a monk um, who, who to help him with the workload of that. And that monk is the only person he tells because he has to tell someone because that way it redounds on his genius. And he's he's made a bit of a name for himself with with the Council of Sicily, Sicily publication. But what what it does is, as I say, he's a grifter. It, it's a it's a source. It's a route to money because the barons are very worried that there's a you know going back to the sort of the Islamic time uh, that it will reveal that there were older uh, laws and prescriptions in place uh, that you know that all the land was owned by the monarchy. And that you know that they are seen as usurpers. So he's sort of he's playing on the wheat on the on the sort of cracks and the fault lines between the monarchy and, and 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 the barons. But he'll you know in the same way as you know religious relics and benedictions were sold for money, he sells to the individual members of the aristocracy. No, no, your your family aren't mentioned in this treatise in this codice, or their rights to the land, inalienable rights to the land, are laid out. You know for some denarii. So he's he's very very exploitative, uh, and I just you know I just think it's a it's a, a wonderful wonderful book. Um, so here here you know this is during the time of potential revolution in the air. Uh, he's talking to one of the one of the nobility. There's not a scribbler alive today who doesn't want to have his say about the organisation of the state, the administration of justice, the rights of the king, and the rights of the people. That's why I admire men like you. You spend your time looking for things in the past and get along in blessed peace with the present. You aren't itching to turn the world upside down. I admire you. I truly do admire you for it. Uh, which overlooks the fact that, yes, he's got his nose in the past, but he's recreating it entirely in the present and with an agenda based in the present. Um, so, yeah, I love this book. Uh, five stars. Now, interestingly, he's a, he, he's mainly known for writing detective uh, fiction. Uh, sp again, set in Sicily, which means that you know there's a lot of stuff around the mafia. And this book reads a bit like a detective novel, but it has you know it, it is beautifully it, you know it romps along. It, the pace of this is wonderful. The chapters are relatively short. It's not often that a chapter will end and the characters involved in the end will be the ones who start the next chapter. So it's always pushing on ahead. And it has a reasonable wide cast of characters, but it's not a complex one. You don't, you don't lose sight of who's who. It's also beautifully and almost effortlessly delineated. So I've become really interested in this author now. I'm going to read a couple of his uh, detective fiction. Um, Daniel, I don't know if you've heard of Leonardo Schiaschia, uh, and you've read any of his detective fiction. Because one of the reasons that, that first attracted me to him was uh, his detectives don't always live, uh, you know, they don't always make, you know, they're not always alive by the end of the novel, which has always interested me as a concept. Uh, and it's something I'm playing around with in, in my current work in progress. Um, so I may have found a new uh, favourite author, even though, you know, people might think this is historical fiction, they'd be wrong. And his other work is detective fiction, which are not my normal genres, but, you know, Wonderful stuff. And on to Death by Anna Croissant Rust. I don't have to spend too much time on this, I'm afraid. So it's split into two parts. One is her uh, is Death, which is a series of short stories, sort of flash fiction length and onwards, although that's an anachronism because she was writing in the late 1800s. Uh, no, the, yeah, the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, when no one had heard of flash fiction. And they're very much about the dance macabre where death is personified in all sorts of different guises as he stroke she appears to the people that that he has come to reap with his, you know. They don't all have a scythe, but a, a metaphorical scythe. But to what to what end? So what, I'm afraid? I didn't, you know, I bought this book because it was called Death, but you know, I couldn't see what it was trying to do, really. And then the second half of the book is is what she calls prose poems, and they form a sort of seasonal cycle, but they're very anthropomorphic, not in the sense of animals being given human characteristics, but the environments being given, things like storms and, and rain and wind and stuff, which I found deeply unsatisfactory. 
the only story I, I prose poem I liked in here was called Summer, and I liked it because it, you know, even though it was summer and the height of, you know, the height of the year in terms of people's enjoyment of, of nature and stuff, it already contained the seeds of decay and, and, and sickness in it, which is the prelude to autumn and stuff. That was the only one that seemed to me to have any motion. You know, it's a cycle. The, the whole the whole collection is a cycle on the weather and on the seasons. But that was the only one that actually had any movement, strangely enough. And the afterword by the translator says he hopes that this forgotten author will be, um, you know, rediscovered. But I'm afraid on the basis of this, that's, uh, that's a forlorn hope. Uh, I think I gave it sort of two and a half stars. Right, on to this difficult book. Uh, Percival Everett by Virgil Russell. Again, Percival Everett is the author. I've read, this is the fourth of his books I've read. He's definitely in the sort of postmodernist sphere, but he's not, he's not a theoretical, you know, bagging away at sort of ideas of postmodernism. He's a playful uh, author. He goes his own way. Um, and this is, I think this is sort of from the middle, late part of his, I mean, he's still writing, he's still alive. But the other, the other postmodernist books I've read of his are very much in the, his early oeuvre. I read a book called So Much Blue, which is, I think, his penultimate book, which wasn't, to my mind, sort of postmodernist at all. I think this sits somewhere in the middle between those. And uh, for Virgil, think Virgil, the uh, guide in Dante's Inferno. For Russell, think Bertrand Russell, the author of Principia Mathematica. I think that was him, not Newton. Uh, also, uh, The History of Western Philosophy. But you don't need to know their, their work to be able to get through uh, this book. So basically, Virgil Russell is a putative father of, of uh, Percival Everett. And they're writing a book. I say they because they keep... It seems to be the father who's writing it, but he keeps sort of offering it to his son to, to take over and write it and complete it as he ages, or to at least just put it in his name. Uh, that's why we have this sort of reversal um, of, of Virgil Russell, who doesn't exist, uh, and Percival Everett, who does exist and may or may not be the son in this book. And the first half of the book is really interesting because there are two or three storylines that, that sort of start and in the back and forth between father and son, they go into, you know, the stories sort of mutate and go in different ways, uh, as I say, because of the back and the forth between the father and the son. But then we move to the second part of the book, which is the, sort of the last two thirds, which all seem to be about the father who is in a retirement home. Uh, very much on the lines of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And I'll, I'll read you the, the description of that. Um, and so, yes, I was brought forth into this fate worse than life. My hand still a-tremble at my memory of my passage through that canal. The way the light hit my eyes. The way the first dose of that disinfected disinfectant painted air worked its way into my not yet acclimated and surprised lungs. But I'm willing to accept that this was the air I was meant to breathe. Not yet ready to become one of the drooling zombies, I resolved to work with the resistance. So, as you read that, you think, oh, this is about being born. But it is. It's about him, his entrance into an old people's home, which I think is, is nicely done, is, is nicely played on. Um, so I was slightly frustrated that the interesting storylines in part one sort of completely disappear in part two. Part two is definitely a much more together narrative much more sense of a story heading somewhere which is about this rebellion in in the, in the old people's home but there are lots of memories there are lots of alternative uh, offerings relating back to the father the history of the father and the son and offering alternative ways that their own history could go so it's a book about obviously family fathers and sons grief bereavement but it's also about uh, narrative and story and founding myths, individual founding myths, not cultural ones. It's also about race. Um, it's really hard to say what the book's about. I really enjoyed it. It's very funny as well, um, but it is quite postmodern. So just to give you, an, this is on page 150, so this is not at the beginning of the book. It's subtitled Preface. I don't know if readers will like your novel, if you choose to write your novel or take credit, perhaps blame, for having written your novel, I don't know. Just don't know if they will like the turns it takes. The turns you find so pleasing. It's comedy. It's fantastic elements. The poems you consider passably original. 
its relaxed and natural transition. Except where abrupt and intentionally jarring, the curious, unconventional mixture of different styles that gives the work a distract, distinctive air, leaving you to hope that you entertain, perhaps upset, maybe frighten a reader. But what a bad professor, preface I have written for you, leaving you nothing to do but tenaciously cling to your conclusions. This is a funny book with natural transitions, except where abrupt, with original fantastical elements, and if all that is true, then your work is beautiful, says who? How bizarre a reader you construct, because you do construct her, him, it, don't you? How bizarre that reader must be to ingest your preface and believe it, or at least not abandon your projected desires concerning your so-called novel. However, in fact, your book might seem to begin in the manner of a definition dialogue, setting out to identify rhetorical stratagems, but concludes, as perhaps all things conclude, appearing as little more than an attempt to discern how one can best find some happiness in life, and in a way, that's the best description I can offer for the book. It has many turns, stylistic turns, some jarring, some smooth. As I say, I really enjoyed it. I wouldn't say start. this is the place to start with Percival Everett. I would start some of his older ones and then sort of graduate onto this. I, I found this more satisfying even than, the, the I think, Glyph and something Desert were the two of his early books that I read. I, I, I enjoyed this more. And I, you know, apart from So Much Blue, which I read about four years ago and didn't particularly enjoy, this is a really good pick-me-up for my, my, my feelings on Percival Everett, because there's several more titles of his uh, to read, including one called Telephone that he's just published, and which has been slated. So, um, But I still feel good about Percival Everett. He's a bit like Sam Lipsight, but to me Sam Lipsight has lots of funny writing, but leaves leaves nothing. It's like, you know, having a, f you know, fast food takeaway and then you're hungry an hour later. There's something a bit more with Everett. Um, so I gave this four stars. And on to Anne Patchett, State of Wonder. So I read uh, Bel Canto last year, I think. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I asked what would be the next the next Anne Patchett I should try. I was resoundingly told this is her best book. And... Um, I was rather underwhelmed about uh, by it, and, and I, I sort of compare her, I think, to uh, the British author Lisa Evans, who wrote Old Baggage, which was my first Lisa Evans, loved it. And then I read a f another book, which is even sort of more well-known than that, called Our Finest, and it's more well-known because it got made into a movie, which I haven't seen. And I thought, hmm... I get her shtick, and I feel with Anne Patchett now, I get her shtick. Now, it doesn't reduce my enjoyment of the first book, respectively, of both of those authors that I read, but I just feel now I don't need to read any more by them. You know, I get it. So this is a story of uh, a one-time uh, student uh, obstetrician who, uh, as a student, had a terrible accident uh, while helping deliver uh, a baby gives up medicine, goes into sort of pharma research. And her her tutor, her uh, lecturer or whatever, was a practising uh, obstetrician who was very fierce, would never know any student's name, would never really look at them or address them directly, but had this huge sort of charisma that just drew everybody's attention. And, you know, everybody was sort of absolutely in awe of this teacher. But she too has, has left uh, medicine and got into pharma, and she is contracted by the pharma company that our heroine uh, works for uh, to go off to the Amazon rainforest where there is a tribe of, of native indigenous people who uh, the women uh, have fertility throughout all their life, even able to give birth, conceive and give birth at age 70. And the farmer wants to know what, what is it that they're doing? You know, what are they consuming from the Amazon that allows them to do this? So ostensibly, this lecturer has gone off to do that and she's been there many years. The farmer company are a bit irritated because she refuses to communicate with them uh, because she doesn't want anyone to, to come to that neck of the woods and, and, and you know, steal the secrets or, or, as she says, infect the tribe, you know, because the, the, the tribe are sort of fairly protected um, from the outside world. So the pharma company sent a guy out who's the who's in, works in the same lab as our heroine, and uh, this lecturer writes a letter to say that unfortunately he's caught a fever and died. So uh, the pharma company are really 
concerned now about what the hell's going on out there. It's sort of shades of uh, of um, heart of darkness, really. Um, uh, this is a sort of a, a female version of Heart and Darkness, with the Electra being Colonel Kurtz and and uh, the heroine here being uh, Marlow, who goes off in search of, of her. Um, so she's got the mission uh, to go and find out what the hell's going on, but also she's got the personal mission because she, you know, she delivers the bad news to the wife about her husband's death in, in the Amazon, and, and the two women sort of commune and, and so she's also going to try and bring his body back or at least if not bring his body back bring his possessions back and find out what happened to him exactly so the middle part of the book she goes to Manaus which is on the, in the equator in Brazil because she's trying to find clues to exactly where in the jungle uh, this woman is uh, and this woman is stationed gatekeepers in Manaus to keep people away so a lot of it is her trying to sort of convince the gatekeepers um, that uh, that she needs that, that you know she needs access to this woman and this woman does come periodically to Manaus to stock up on supplies and stuff so you know they meet eventually and she goes back with this woman in into the into the tribe so all through this the heroine has been a sort of a little underwhelming in terms of she's a bit of a drifting through life you know she was going to be an obstetrician and then she retreats to farmer she was married briefly she's now divorced um she's sort of having this sort of uh relationship with the head of the farmer company but you know he's 20 years older than her she's in her 40s so it's all a bit desultory then suddenly once she gets to the amazon well not suddenly but you know she she becomes a bit of a superwoman really and she's not only sort of doing everybody's everybody's beck and call, including helping the tribe with her sort of former medical knowledge. Um, what she doesn't realise is she's been manipulated by her ex-lecturer to uh, to do things that, you know, she wants. Now, the problem is, I didn't believe the transition to a sort of one level under Superwoman and the heroine. I really disliked the character of the lecturer because she was so cold and, and detached and stuff. Um, you find out uh, what's what's behind the fertility, what substances are behind the fertility. Uh, there's supposed to be a shock in that, and it isn't shocking at all. It's entirely predictable. Uh, but also, uh, the le the uh, the lecturer is not only working on this fertility. She's actually, the, you know, she's got a secondary thing she's discovered because it's all interlinked biologically, and that's that's the thing she's really trying to protect, not not the fertility stuff. Um, and that's, you know, she doesn't even want her farmer company to know about it because that's not what they're paying her for. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about, you know, women, you know, the, the idea of a fertility drug for, for childless women at age, you know, 20, 30, 40 makes a lot of sense. But there's a lot of discussion about, well, why would a 70, why, what's the advantage of having a 70 year old woman uh, having fertility? And then we get all the stuff about this secret stuff side project that she's got going and by that stage I didn't care the the book had lost me it started off being a character study and I realised I didn't really like either of the characters and the heroine as I say wasn't you know by the time she transformed to Superwoman I didn't buy that and I really didn't like the Electra character and then we get to the politics of it all and you know that that how to protect this tribe from you know being exposed through this work uh, and even being exposed to you know the neighbouring tribe of, of sort of cannibals and stuff and yeah I didn't care really I'm afraid perfectly well written um, three stars and finally OK Mr Field by uh, Catherine Killalea Kale sorry Killalea this is a really pleasing book but it'd be hard to recommend it so this guy who works in London he's a concert pianist he gets caught up in a train accident which sort of snaps his wrist and basically there, there goes his professional career as a pianist. And he, on a whim, decides to move to South Africa with his wife into a house on the coast which is a copy or an homage to Le, one of Le, Le Corbusier's uh, Machines for Living designs of houses. And this book is very much about space and perception that space, the space sort of shapes. So, for example, it has horizontal windows. So although it's right on the sea, 
the horizontal nature of the windows almost you know makes the sea a slit rather than sort of filling the whole expanse of, of a normal window and there's lots of interesting things about that and it is all about sort of perception and ways of seeing and angles which relate to how you view people as well his wife leaves him and he goes into a sort of steady decline along with this house that he's gradually taking apart you know he's letting in the elements of wind and rain by sort of opening up the house uh, and it's it's an odd book that's why I can't necessarily recommend it but I really enjoyed it I, you know I found it rather sort of beguiling really uh, there's not much more to say than that um, yeah <laughs> sorry that I currently be of, of, of more more help but yeah, as I say I, I, I was won over by this book okay so that's what I oh I gave it four stars so that's what I have read this week so uh, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday, I should be reading uh, a new book from um, Galley Beggars Press. This is James Clammer's Insignificance. Uh, and it's, I, bought, I bought it basically because it's a book about a working class man, which you don't see very often in fiction. I don't know if the author is working class, but this is a story about a plumber and a difficult day in his life, I think. That's all I know about it. That's all I wanted at this stage. So, looking forward to that. And then uh, June opens up with two buddy reads. I have got Nervous System by a Chilean author called Lina Murnane, I think. Uh, this is translated by Megan McDowell. This is a buddy read with Roxy over at A Chaotic Bibliophile. Roxy is turning me on to some wonderful Chilean uh, literature, contemporary literature. This is the third Chilean book I would have read thanks to her recommendation so we're doing that and Detransition Baby I don't think I need to say anything about this book by Tori Peters which is a buddy read with Brian at Bookish and Zena at Beating Around the Books um, now because I had those two buddy reads for the start of January it meant I had to rethink about my reading my mammoth for June bearing in mind that July I've not, I, I knew I wasn't going to be reading one because that's when my book comes out um so what I, the reason why I didn't do a Friday Reads last week is I, I realised I had a mammoth non-fiction book. So because I'd finished uh, May's Mammoth you know, by halfway through the month, I picked this up thinking that I was going to finish it uh, in, in, in May. And actually, as you can see, I put it down because it, it is it's mammoth, not the number of pages. I don't think it's about 480 pages plus all the footnotes and stuff takes it up to about 550. But it's mammoth in how dense it is. Um, so I put it down to read all the stuff I've talked about today. And I will pick it up after I've done the buddy reads and hopefully finish, because I'm almost halfway through it, uh, and finish it in June. And that will be my, my mammoth. So a bit unpredictable. I never expected to be really a non-fiction mammoth. Uh, but you know, that's how it's turned out. So hopefully I will still be doing uh, mammoth uh, per month up until July. Uh, I'll also be reading Garbage, which is a long poem, uh, which is recommended by uh, Courtney Ferreter. So that'll be, again, my sixth, uh, you know, uh, a poetry collection uh, per month. Uh, and then obviously by the end of June, one hits the, um, you know, half halfway point of the year and people do their, their sort of summing up for the first half of the year. So I would be on course with six mammoths and on course with six uh, poetry collections. Um, so yeah, there you have it. I'm really looking forward to the two buddy reads starting next week uh, and the books that were, you know that are involved. Um, I'm very interested to see how I get on with D Transition, baby. Um, so thanks very much. Till next time.